Hey everybody, Katie Cleaver, Nurse Cyril, Hannah Cleaver, Matt Cleaver. Tosh is over there, but you can't see him. I'm sure if somebody barks or somebody walks by, he's going to start barking, so you'll see him. But we want to talk about central lines. Um, it's, I was trying to record these videos um, with Hannah sleeping, but not working. So I figured, hey, we're going to have to have Hannah in the video getting cuddles simultaneously while we're talking central lines. Okay. So, central lines, they are confusing. Even if you've been a nurse for a while, they are confusing. There's so many new products out there that make it really difficult to know everything about them. So just to encourage people that are not used to central lines, they're, they're confusing. I think Hannah's enamored with the picture of herself up here. <laughs> so, um, things to know. What is a central line? It's this huge, it's, it's kind of a big IV that can go in the subclavian area, the IJ, the femoral area, to basically deliver fluids or medications into the um, SVC, superior vena cava, that dumps right into the right atrium. So the reason that it's in that location is because it's basically delivering it to the right atrium where there's this large volume of blood immediately and it gets diluted immediately. So that way you're not like sticking something in a peripheral IV and it's got to go all the way up your arm and then to your heart before it's diluted. It's actually just right there. So the way you know that something is a central line is maybe looking at a chest x-ray to see if the tip terminates in the SVC or superior vena cava. That's how you know something is a central line. So there's a lot of different ones that are for different purposes. Me working in critical care, we're, the reason we're typically seeing them is someone's getting a huge amount of volume resuscitation or they're getting vasoactive or um, medications that really screw up the vein. So that's why we have to get them in a central line. But a central line is kind of a big deal because it's this line that goes straight from the outside into a person's heart. So we have to make sure that it is cleaned appropriately, that it's utilized appropriately and only put in when you really, really need it. So that's kind of the ba basics of a central line and why you need them. There is one thing, so I don't know if anyone's heard of a PIC line, a peripherally inserted centralized catheter, and it goes in, let me see if I can do this without knocking hand over it, right typically here area, like the upper arm, but it does still end in the same spot. So it's peripherally inserted, meaning in an arm or something, as opposed to like right here, right here, or in somebody's uh, groin region peripherally inserted centralized catheter. But there is something called a midline catheter, which looks exactly the same. It's confusing. It looks exactly the same as a pick line, but it stops in this like axilla region. So it, it's a short pick line, but it looks the same. They're basically cut short. Um, the reason people insert these is typically if someone's just a really bad IV stick and we gotta get some sort of a line, they're not so awesome though because they look the same as a central line. So people assume they're a central line and can give medications and give things in them that you can only give through a central line. So that's something that's important to know. Um, is it truly, if it looks like a pick line, is it truly a central line? And what I typically get in the habit of doing is if I've got a patient with a central line, I'm gonna pull, I typically pull up the last chest x-ray that confirms placement just so I know, especially if I'm given things like Levofed, Neo, that kind of stuff. I always want to double check to make sure. So basically after the central line is inserted, which it can be done in the OR at the bedside in a procedural area, it's the nurse's responsibility to take care of it. So we're responsible for the care and the maintenance and the removal of central lines, which is a big responsibility. It's this line that's going straight to somebody's heart. We really have to pay close attention to making sure we're doing it properly because we can give someone a bloodstream infection just from that central line. So that's what a CLABC is, a central line associated bloodstream infection. And it's totally, if it's, if it's related to the central line, then it's totally preventable. It's something that we caused and can kill somebody from giving them infec an infection from there. So it's really important to make sure that we're doing it appropriate, caring for it appropriately. So that means following your hospital's policy and procedures, like checking out exactly what you're supposed to do. Like I know with us, if I'm pulling back blood and taking um, 
blood samples and I'm pulling blood through the caps at the end of it, I have to change the cap every time blood goes through it. Because it makes sense. If blood's hanging out in that cap and it's not all fully flushed flushed through, then that is a great medium for bacteria to grow. So you got to make sure that you're flushing it through. Um, another thing is if you can't get blood return that you're not using it and you're following whatever protocol you have. So for us it would be putting TPA in the line to get rid of that little clot at the end. And the reason this is a big deal is when you can't get blood return, that, may, that means it's that this lumen has created a one-way valve. So a clot has formed at the end of it and you can push fluid through but you can't get it back out so there's a clot over the end of it. So you got to get rid of that clot because what if you flush it and that clot dislodges and goes somewhere? That can kill somebody. So it's a really big deal. So if you have if you can flush it but you can't get blood return, that's a big thing. Do not use that line until you TPA it as soon as possible. So that's really really important to do. Um, and or TPA or whatever your policy is, but but most likely you're not going to be able to use that line until you flood until you're able to get blood return, which is why you need to check for blood return every time you use it. Oh, we lost the bank. Okay, so um, that's a really important thing to do. We try and think of all the important things. We got to clean it appropriately. So every time we're accessing it, we're scrubbing the hub or using one of the Kiros caps or um, safety cap things on it that are that disinfect it. But something that's important to know is let's say you're giving one med. So you have the flush, the med, and the other flush. So when you do that, you know, you, you put, you f so you, let's say there's a Kiros cap on it. You take the Kiros cap off, you flush it. Well, you have to clean it again before you attach that medication syringe to it. I know it's clean, but we have to clean the hub again. So that means that you're swabbing it after the, after the flush af and after the med and then again. So you shouldn't be just using one alcohol swab when you're flushing line with, and giving a med and flushing again. That's something I didn't learn until like last year and I've been a nurse six years. So if you don't know some of this stuff, don't feel bad. <laughs> I've sat on various committees and read, a, read re various research and stuff and it's taken time for me to learn all this stuff. It's not something I learned before I started. Um, other things that are important to know is the dressing. You have to check out the dressing and make sure it looks okay. Um, you only want to change it at max, typically once a week, even if it, if it looks perfect. You're not going to change it every day because every time you take the dressing off, you're introducing that line to um, the outside world and infection. And <laughs> I'm boring Hannah, what do you know? Central lines, not her thing. Um, so that's really important. Another thing is if someone is getting a line put in in the first place, you can't take IV tubing that is connected to like a peripheral IV and just stick it right to that central new central line. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Um, so for the new central line, you have to have all fresh tubing. <laughs> even even if you only have been using that, maybe you put in up that new tubing just today for that peripheral line. The second you're starting a brand new central line, you need brand new tubing. So that's really important to know. Other things that are important to know. Let's see. Um, I think that's pretty much it for care and maintenance. Um, also, like if you're checking for blood return and you get blood all the way up into your chamber, it's, you probably should change the cap because you're getting blood through there. But if you're just seeing it in the line before the cap, that's okay. You just need to verify that you can get blood. So that's really, really important. Um, so removal is a big deal. Okay, so when you remove a central line, you have to lay the patient flat. And the one thing I really recommend is getting out the checklist because most hospitals and policy procedures will have a, this is how you remove it, step-by-step -step checklist. Those things are awesome. And I always pull them out because I can never remember every little step. So I would, I, I would pull it out, check it out, make sure you're following it step-by-step. -step. And one of the things in there is probably one line that says lay the patient flat. I cannot stress how big of a deal that is because if you take a central line out and someone's sitting up like I am now, you can cause an air embolism and you can kill somebody. It's a big deal. Um, so I remember a few years ago I was watching, I remember if it was, it was an article on CNN.com and it was like the never ever should happen medical mistakes, you know, like someone cutting off the wrong limb, um, you know, things like that. 
And one of them was pulling out a central line while someone was sitting, sitting up. So they gave, they showed a picture of this guy, 18 or 20 years old. He had some sort of infection, and I can't remember the details. But he had an infection, and then he had a central line. And with this, he was fine. He was getting discharged, going home, like 18, 20, 22-year-old guy. So the nurse pulled out his central line, and he was sitting up. He coded, and he died. Getting ready to go home. Coded and died. Because the nurse pulled the central line out while the... (laughs) while the patient was sitting up. So that's how important it is. And even if the family doesn't, oh, he doesn't like to lay flat. Well, the, the risk of him staying up while I'm taking this out and give it, of giving him a pulmonary embolism is pretty high if he's sitting up. So I need to lay him flat even if it's uncomfortable. Now, if there's some medical reason he can't, he or she can't lay flat, that's a different thing. But still, it is vital that the patient lays flat while you're taking the line out. And make sure you're following the policy about how to do it. But it's really important to do that. It's something about the pressure between atmospheric pressure and the pressure in the chest and pulling the line out. Yeah. And if you think the patient has an air embolism, you want to put them on their left side to trap the air and the right atrium or ventricle to prevent it to getting into the pulmonary circulation. Um, so that's really, really, really important to know. I mean, people people die from this. and eat, But... The thing to know is if you, even if you do it like perfectly right, you may not, you know, there's still that possibility, but you significantly reduce the risk of that occurring if you lay the patient flat. So that's something that you need to know. And when you're removing it, that you're documenting that you did all the things that are appropriate. Like after I've removed a line, I put in a little nurse's note, like patient laid flat, uh, occlusive dressing applied, um, policy and procedure followed specifically, you know, like something like that that really covers you. Because if if something really did occur, or does occur, then, you know, you can say that, yeah, I actually did everything the way I was supposed to, and I have no idea why this occurred, but I did it the way that I'm supposed to do it. So that's really important to make sure you're doing. So those are my central line kind of tips. Um, And if you have any explanations or tips or anything, please put a comment down below. People, you know, this is a great way for people to learn and figure out how to do these because they're very, very overwhelming. Um, Keep in mind though, you always gotta follow your policies and procedures. This is just for information. This is not, should never supersede what your policies of your hospital says you should do. And the thing to know about central lines is they change frequently. I mean, and, and we find out better ways to do things and new products become available. So, you know, this stuff, just because you learned something when you were orienting 10 years ago, doesn't mean that's the way it's still done because things change so frequently with medicine. So it's really important to be aware of the latest policies and procedures and doing things the right way. So um, that is something I really want to encourage people to do is know what their policy and procedure says. And, you know, if you got trained on this stuff many years ago, there's a good chance that things have changed and best practices have changed. So I really want to encourage you to take a look at the latest um, policy and procedures that you have. And also nursing professional organizations do have a lot of great resources about central lines. I'm a member of the AACN, for, so the Association for Critical Care Nurses, the ANA for you know the American Nurses Association, and the AANN for neuroscience nurses, and they all have access to various journals with tons of evidence-based practice. So if you're not sure what is the best for your patient population, so maybe you work in oncology, those patients, a lot of them have central lines, but they have some things are a little different with them because they have their severely compromised immune systems. So it would be great to go on their, you know, their website, check out what their resources are and what their latest evidence-based practice says about the best way to take care of central lines. And they have a lot of different ones that they use more so than myself within critical care. Same thing maybe with dialysis nurses and stuff. So just want to encourage you to check out your resources, check out what the latest evidence says. And if you're finding that the latest evidence says that something is recommended that your hospital's not doing, then you as a nurse are more than capable and more than qualified enough to print off that evidence and say, no, like Hannah says. Um, 
But you're more than qualified enough to, like, print off the stuff, say, hey, this is what the latest evidence says, but our policy doesn't reflect that. Like, how can I facilitate this change in our hospital to make sure that our patients are getting the most um, up-to-date care as possible? So I just want to encourage you to do that if you find something that is not congruent with what your hospital's policies and procedures say. So that is our story about central lines, and we're sticking to it. Right, Hannah? So I hope you guys have a great day. Uh-oh. It's a good time for us to sign off. Bye.